Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil mursalin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve baraka ve selleme tesliman kathiran ila yevmiddin amma ba'd. Kala Allahu tebaraka ve teala fil Qur'anil Mecidi vel Furkanil Hamid fellezine keferu kutti'at lehum thiyabun min nar. Sadaqallahu l'azim. Our dear friends, welcome back to number 14. We are on the 14th um, session of this series on hell described, hell defined. Today we, the discussion for today is regarding the clothing of the people of Hellfire. That will be followed by a discussion about the size of the people of Hellfire. And I think once we understand that, once we go through that, a lot of what we've been reading so far will will be put into perspective. Again, the only way we can understand these things is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, as much as He's revealed to us, and then from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then the Sahaba, and the companions. So, let us start. This is about the clothing of the people of Hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 19, فَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا قُطِّعَتْ لَهُمْ ثِيَابٌ مِّن نَّارٌ Initially, the discussion, um, it looks like <clears throat> the author, who is uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he has first put all those Quranic verses, and the majority of them, actually the Quranic verses and hadith about the clothing, are all regarding disbelievers. Then there's some general narrations that don't mention believers or disbelievers, and then there's some that refer to believers as well. So, Firstly, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah says, those who disbelieve, they will be, their garments will be cut for them from the fire. So their garments will be made of fire. It will be cut from pieces of fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how that's going to be. That's why Ibrahim at taymi rahimahullah, when he would recite this, he says, Subhana man khalaqa minan nari thiyaban. Glorified is he, glorified is the one who can create clothing and garments from the fire. Subhanallah. You know, nowadays you've got garments made of all sorts of things that you would never have thought you could get it made from. Like for example, polyester, if you're wearing polyester or nylon, all of that is actually made from crude oil. It's a, it, the threads are made by certain, you know, by, by formulate, formulating the crude oil in a way that it then makes strands and then after that you weave that together. That's why it's like almost like a plastic. Now, where would have any have thought, anybody have thought that from this crude oil that comes out of the ground, you're going to make garments from there? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do as He wishes, just the way He's created angels from light, humans from soil. There's going to be garments He'll make out of the hellfire. That's why there's another narration then from... Abbas al Juraidi, who reckons that he took this from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, yuqta' lil kafir thiyabu min nar hatta dhakar al or dhukir al quba or qaba wal qamis wal kumma. So all the garments of the people of Hellfire are going to be made of fire until they actually have mentioned the over kind of garment, the shirt or tunic and like a cap, a cap as well. Kumma is a cap. So all of this, and that will all be a source of punishment essentially. Thereafter that Abu Dawud, Imam Abu Dawud and others have transmitted a hadith from Al-Mustawrid, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, مَنْ أَكَلَ بِرَجُلٍ مُسْلِمٍ أَكْلَةً وَأُكْلَةً فِي الدُّنْيَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ مِثْلَهَا فِي جَهَنَّمْ Whoever consumes, this is really interesting hadith, whoever consumes, at the expense of another Muslim, right? Any kind of food, any kind of, any kind of food in the dunya, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will feed him the like of it in Jahannam. What does that mean? I'll just mention the second part and then I'll put it in perspective. Whoever wears or is made to wear or given to wear at the expense of another Muslim person. A garment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them wear something like it in Jahannam. Which basically means that if you've received any kind of food, 
any kind of garment, and that would mean any kind of income, by unjustly discrediting somebody, by abusing someone, meaning at the expense of someone else. You had to say something bad about someone, you had to report someone, you had to give false testimony about someone, or whatever the case is, then you will have to, you will be given something the like of. So you might enjoy that in this world, you might enjoy that in this one thing that's great, but then in the hereafter you'll be given a payment for that. So then there's another hadith that Imam Ahmed has transmitted in his Musnad that the Prophet ﷺ said, now these are all the people who have these, because it's all garment related, it's people who do things with clothing in the world, so they, have to, they will be punished by it in the hereafter. Okay? So remember, we don't want to earn clothing or food because of doing something wrong to someone. Right. The next one, Musnad Ahmad, Prophet ﷺ said, Man wati'a izarahu khuyala wati'ahu fin nar. Whoever tramples upon, I mean the literal translation is that whoever tramples upon their lower garment out of arrogance, they will have to do this in the hellfire. There's another narration which is similar to this in Sahih al-Bukhari, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that that which is ma taht al-ka'bayni min al-izari fa fin nar, that which is below the ankles of the lower garment is going to be in the hellfire. So, what's going to be in hellfire? Not just the garment, but the, the feet are in the hellfire. They're going to be punished in their feet and ankles for doing this in the world. And then the garment part of it is going to be used as a source of punishment in the hellfire. Or they're going to have to be dragging this cloth in the hellfire, which is made of fire. Now, I know there's lots of discussion about dangling the garments and some have said it's makru only or it's fine if you don't do it out of arrogance and so on however while all of that discussion is there and maybe that could be used by some people in some extreme circumstances wallahu alam but when you look at it holistically there's so much about it and there's actually one narration in which i think umar radiallahu anhu defined that if you do drag it meaning if it is extended then that is arrogance itself. It's not that you do it separately for arrogance, but doing that in itself is an arrogant attitude, not to keep it up, but to let it dangle. So um, it should be avoided at either cost. It should be avoided and one should make an effort that they should minimize this and completely eradicate it. Uh, if eventually, if they can't do it now, they should do so uh, because there's just so many clear narrations about this. Then there's another hadith which will come later that the person with the lightest form of punishment in the hellfire will be the one who's made to wear slippers, some kind of footwear that are made of fire by which it will cause his brains to boil. And there is obviously the, when they do a foot massage, the benefit of a foot massage generally is that there's a number of reflexology points there which actually... Uh, effect different parts of the body. It's really interesting. So here it's saying that this is going to cause the brain to boil. I don't know if it, I remember once I, I went to South Africa and it was, I had to stop over in Kenya on the way. We were quite tired by the time we got to South Africa. And mashallah, my friend there, may Allah bless him, he said, just lie down, let me give you a foot massage. And I was like, okay. The foot massage he gave me just sorted me out. Like it just removed the tiredness. It was quite amazing, right? It was just the foot massage as well. So there are, there's, I mean, there's reflexology points there and, and so on. Okay, then Imam Abu Dawud, Imam Nasai, Imam Tirmidhi and so on have transmitted from Buraida radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw on somebody's hand, somebody's finger, an iron ring, a metal ring, an iron ring. It was not silver, it was normal metal. He said, why am I seeing on you an adornment of the people of hellfire? Now that could mean two things. It obviously means that the people of hellfire generally do this, so you shouldn't do this. And it could also mean, I mean, in an extended sense that maybe they will be made to wear rings of fire on the day of judgment, uh, sorry, uh, in the hellfire as well. Either way, it's something that should be avoided. Uh, only, yep, silver rings are allowed for men. 
Then there's another narration from Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the first person who will be made to wear a garment of, made from hellfire, this special garment made from hellfire, it's not been promoted in the world yet, nobody's discovered it in the world yet, right? Is Iblis, that's in the hellfire. And it's really strange, it will be placed by his forehead, by his eyebrows. And it, his, his dhuriya, his descendants will drag it from the back. And he'll be saying, Ya Thabura, Ya Thabura, which means, Oh death, Oh death, I just wish I died. And they're going to be also calling Ya Thaburahum until eventually when they get to the hellfire, they will be calling that. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Furqan, verse 14, La tadu al yawma thubura wahida wa du thubura kathira. Don't just call for one death today, call for many, many deaths. Because you're going to need a lot, because you're constantly going to be brought back to life. So today, lots of things are going to be put into perspective that we've been wondering about, that was in my mind as well. There's another hadith from Umar radiallahu anhu that Jibreel, the angel radiallahu anhu, said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the one who has sent you with the truth, if just a garment of the garments of hellfire were to be suspended between the heavens and the earth, everybody in the earth would die because of its heat. It's worse than the sun. Well, if the sun was much closer, we'd die probably, right? If it was 93 million miles away, we'd probably die if it was quite closer. So this is what he's saying. Or maybe this is stronger than the sun. Wallahu alam. The next section is about a type of clothing. So this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah to Ibrahim, verse 49 and 50, وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ سَرَابِيلُهُمْ مِنْ قَطِرَانٍ وَتَغْشَى وُجُوهَهُمُ النَّارِ You'll see the mischief makers, the wrongdoers on that day, they will be shackled in chains and so on. They'll be shackled. سَرَابِيلُهُمْ سَرَابِيلْ سِرْبَال This refers to a tunic, a garment, a dress. The main dress, the main dress that you wear, the main garment that you wear. That is going to be made of tar. That's going to be made of tar. Right? That black stuff, that really ugly, smelly black stuff that we used to you know, pave the roads. And their faces will be overcome by the fire. It's going to be intense heat and then tar coal when it's hot. That burns you, that's really like a persecution, serious punishment. So what exactly does this qatiran, I translated it already. There's different opinions about what exactly this qatiran is. Their garment is going to be made of this qatiran. I, transfer, I translate it as tarkol. However, according to Ibn Abbas, عنه, he said that that means it's made of molten copper. Copper, melted copper, that you're going to have to be made to wear that. It's going to be kind of bubbling on you. How it's going to stay together, I don't know. But that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of doing things there. Now, what's really interesting is that if somebody's getting really fine, like, what's wrong with Allah? Why is He doing this? Well, He's got much better stuff in paradise. And if you're listening to this, we've still got a chance to get to paradise. That's the beauty of it. There's no point complaining about this, like, why did Allah say, well, look at paradise. It's actually much better than this. As bad as this is, paradise is much, much better in the intensity of how good it is. We've already covered that first. It's online. Uh, the delights of paradise. We've, we've got, I don't know how many lectures on that, 27 or something like that. Right? Inshallah, hellfire will be less lectures. I think we aim to finish it in the next like five, six lectures, but uh, paradise is a lot bigger, mashallah. Right? right, another opinion from Ikrima is that this, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. This is actually lead. He says it's made of lead, so it's some kind of molten ore, it seems. Then in Sahih Muslim, now this gives us some more understanding of this. Abu Malik al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the na'iha, the na'iha is that professional woman. You don't get them as much. You get like different iterations of that today. But these are the women that used to be hired when somebody died to come and wail for you. You know, they, in, in certain programs, they invite dancers to create enjoyment. This was to add to the sadness, to rile people up. Because if nobody cried at the, if there was nobody to cry like properly and uh, 
tear their clothing, mm. like pull their hair out as such, then that wasn't a good ceremony. It wasn't a good death ceremony. So you kind of owed it to your deceased to go and do this. If you didn't have somebody do this in the family, in-house, then you hired somebody. And these were women called na'iha. Right? They used to do niyaha. So he's saying that any woman like that, who generally used to be women who did this, right? they were the actors in this. Any woman who doesn't, so any woman who does not repent before her death, then she will be made to stand on the day of judgment, and on her will be these kind of garments. So these kind of garments will be on such people as well, and she will also have darum min jarab, which means a coat of armor, like a metal pe- coat of armor. Well, I don't know if it's metal. It just says a coat of armor of scabies or itching. Which essentially means that it will be, she will be covered in itch, in a, a covered in scabies, as though it's an armor on her, because an armor fits very tight and it protects you. So if you've got a covering of scabies on you, which means that you can't get out of it. You imagine sometimes where you're somewhere and you're in a really tight garment, it's very hot and itchy. How suffocating that is! How difficult that is! You just can't wait home to take it off and change it. This is something you cannot take on of his lot to you. Ibn Majah, uh, the, the hadith collector, he's got another, he's got, in his version, the Prophet ﷺ must have said that this kind of wailing and crying and lamenting is from the jahiliyyah, ignorant practices. And again, the same thing, that if such a person dies without having repented, then they're going to have specially designed garments of this qatiran, this molten lead or molten copper or tar, and this armor of flame. It's going to be very hot and really, really uncomfortable. Not just uncomfortable, it's going to be painful and horrible. Ibn Majah has another narration in which Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yeah, it's the same kind of narration, just a bit more detail. It's the same kind of narration. There's lots of narrations about this. Right, let's look at another verse now. That verse is quite clear what qatiran means and it's been described. Now let's look at another verse in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 41. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهُم مِّن جَهَنَّمَ مِهَادٌ وَمِن فَوْقِهِمْ غَوَاشٌ Now this is kind of moving away from clothing you wear to cloth that you use which is your bed, what you lie on, what you sit on, and what you cover yourself with. So it's kind of moving to that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Jahannam, in hellfire, for them will be mihad. I'll describe what mihad is. I'm just going to leave it as mihad right now. And above them will be gawash. So there'll be mihad under them and gawash above them. What mihad and gawash means, I'll let the scholars speak about that. So Muhammad ibn Ka'ab, Dahak, Suddi, these are all mufassirs, ex, um, commentators of the Qur'an. They're saying, Mihad is firash. It's your bedding. It's what you sit on. Right? It's your carpet. Right? What you sit on, what you rest on, what you sleep on. And gawash is essentially your duvet, your blanket, your cover. So in hellfire, there's going to be a kind of a covering and there's going to be kind of a something to, that you will be made to sit on. But all of this is not some kind of comfort. These things are considered comfortable in the world. If you don't have a blanket, that's not very comfortable. Generally in the winter, it's not comfortable. If you don't have carpet or a bed, that's not very comfortable. But in hellfire, all of this is switched around to a punishment. That's why Hassan Basri rahimahullah says, وَجَعَلْنَا جَهَنَّمَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ حَصِيرًا This is verse 8 of Surah Al-Isra that we have made the Jahannam for the disbelievers a hasir. Hasir is a mat, is your mat on the ground. So, um, they're essentially, it's a place for them to stay. That's what he's saying. Firash and wamihada, that's what he said. Um, Qatada says what that means is that this will be their imprisonment, this will be their captivity. Now, this same Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, whenever he would remember the people of hellfire, he would sum it up. After, after 
looking at all of the narrations and what he had heard about it from, from the Sahaba and so on, he would say, they, these people of Hellfire, he describes them, this is very descriptive actually, he says that they will be provided designed, specially designed slippers or footwear of, of, of fire. Their garment, their tunic will be of this molten lead or copper or charcoal. Their food will be of fire. Their drink will be of fire. What, what they lay on and what they sit on will be of fire. What they cover themselves with will be of fire. The places where they stay will be fire. They'll be in the worst of abodes, in the worst and most painful and horrible punishments, both in their body. The punishment will be afflicted on their body in three ways. In their consuming, in their ingesting what they try to consume, as we've been discussing in the last few weeks, of what they're made to eat and drink. In terms of them melting, their body will be made to melt. That will be a type of punishment. Then it will be recreating. You'll understand that. And number three, hatman, hatman, which means what they will be, their body will be crushed, broken, and cracked in different ways. Again, another narration from Hassan Basi. He says that there was somebody from the early days uh, of this of uh, among Muslim, meaning after the Prophet ﷺ's time, that whenever he would enter the graveyard, whenever he would enter the graveyard, he would, I mean, subhanAllah, it's probably for himself because the people in the grave, they're gone. Right? But this is probably for himself, probably for the people around him. He would, say, he would announce this. He would say this loudly, Ya Ahl al-Qubur, O people of hellfire, بعد الرفاهية والنعيم معالجة الأغلال في النار After all of your comfort and your luxury and all of the bounties that you enjoyed, now you're going to have to deal with all of the shackles and the chains of hellfire. After your cotton and linen, which, which were the best kind of cloths in those days, after your cotton and linen, now you have to wear this qataran, qitaran and these cloths made out, of, made out of fire. And out of enjoying having servants and large entourages, and enjoying your spouses, you have to now be with the shaitan in the hellfire. And you have to be shackled in the hellfire. This was obviously a reminder. May Allah make it a reminder for us as well. Wahab ibn Munabbih. He is one of the early scholars there who lots of this is related from. It's related from, he says, as far as the people of hellfire are concerned. They're going to be in hellfire. They're never going to be able to take a rest. They're never going to feel tranquil. They're never going to be able to relax. They're never going to be able to chill, whatever word you want to use. They're not going to be able to sleep. But they're not going to die either. They will have to walk on the, hell, on the fire. They will have to sit on fire. They'll have to drink from the pus of the people of hellfire. They'll have to consume that zakum tree in hellfire. They're, what, they, what they sit on will be made of fire. What they cover themselves with will be fire. Their clothing will be fire and of qitran, of this molten metal. Their faces will be over whelmed with fire and the people of hellfire they won't be able to do anything by themselves because he says all the people of hellfire will be shackled in chains held by the gods of hellfire they will be pulled and dragged pulled back dragged forward by these people as they want so then their pus, because when you, when you have a body and the heat affects it and you get burnt, what happens to a burnt body? All of that pus and everything is generated from the boils and everything like that. All of that will come about. That will then drip into those reservoirs at the bottom of hellfire. That will then be refed to them and recycled to them as their drink. After explaining all of this, he started crying. And eventually he fell unconscious. He just started focusing on this and he fell unconscious. Now Bakr ibn Khunais who's transmitting this from him, when he's now relating this narration, he started crying so much that he wasn't able to speak. 
And another narrator, Muhammad ibn Ja'far, he also was overcome by, by crying when he transmitted this as well. Ata al Khurasani, he would say to his friends when they were on a journey, oh Ibrahim, oh Yusuf, oh Musa, you know, whoever they were. When you're on a generally when you're at home, it's easy maybe to do tahajjud and get up at night to make dua. But when you're traveling because you're tired and so on, they may have been a bit relaxed. So he says, such and such person, oh so and so, so and so. Standing in the night and praying and fasting in the daytime is going to be much easier than to have to drink from all of the pus and to have to wear all of these things that is mentioned. Al-waha, thumma al-waha, thumma al-waha. Maybe we give, may, may we be given delivery, may we be given safety, then safety, then safety. And then he would start his prayer. One of the most famous poets of his of the Arab world, Muslim, is called Farazdaq. He was at that really crucial point during the grandson of Ali radiallahu anhu's time. I think uh, Harun Rashid or Ma'mun Rashid's time. So he was there during the Abbasid times, so a very peak of you know, civilization at that time. And he's a wonderful poet. Now, there's mixed reactions about him. His wife died. Nawar, her name was. She died. So he's at the grave. Hassan Basri, rahimahullah, is there as well. He turns up in Basra, I'm assuming this is. So he turns up in Basra. So after they'd buried her and smoothened the soil over her, he said to Hassan, Hassan didn't approach him. He said to Hassan Basri, rahimahullah, have you heard what people are saying? So, so Hassan Basi said, what, is, what are people saying? So then Farazdaq said that people are saying that the best and worst of people are here today. right? And the best person is you, and the worst person is me. So Hassan immediately, you know, he, he, is like the, he is the scholar of the time. He says, no, 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 you're not the worst of them, and I'm not the best of them. But tell me, what have you prepared for this day? I mean, this is a very emotional time for you. This must be a very reflective moment for your wife has died. Right? So then he said to him, Abu Sa'id, Shahadatu Allah ilaha illallah. The testimony of there is no God except Allah. SubhanAllah, Hassan Basri, he started crying. It's a moment, he started crying. And he hugged, he embraced Farazdaq. And he said, you used to be one of the worst people in my sight before, one of the most hated people in my sight because of stuff he used to say maybe. But today you've become one of the most beloved people in my sight. That if you have this in your heart, that you've got shahada to Allah, ilaha illallah, you may say these crazy things, but mashallah in your heart, you are now saying la ilaha illallah, you know, with sincerity and you expect it for this day, then you must be good. So then Farazdaq, it seems like this is what he then said. He said the following poem. أخاف وراء القبر إن لم يعافني أشد من القبر التهابا وأضياقا إذا جاءني يوم القيامة قاعد عنيف وسواق يسوق الفرز دقا لقد خاب من أولاد آدم من مشى إلى النار مغلول القلالة أزرقا يساق إلى الجحيم مسربلا سرابيل قطران لباسا محرقا إذا شربوا فيها الصديد رأيتهم يذوبون من حر الصديد تمزقا. When he said that, Hassan رحمه الله, he started crying as well. That what a wonderful poem. So basically, he's saying that I fear after this grave, beyond this grave, if Allah, if if I'm not given safety, the I fear after this time of this grave, if I'm not given safety, worse than what is in the grave in terms of flames and and other things. If on the day of judgment, there comes to me somebody to grab me and to pull me and to drag me, right? Who will drag Farazdaq as well? Then anybody from the children of Adam who has to walk to the hellfire has been destroyed, has failed. If they've been shackled, if they've been girdled, right? If they've been dragged to the hellfire with garments that are made out of this molten lead 
and molten copper, which will be intensely burning. And when they have to drink in there the pus and so on, you will see that when they drink this from this pus, that they will be melted, they will melt from the heat of this pus and they will break apart and break into pieces. When Hassan Rahimahullah, he heard that, that he, he, he began to weep as well. So it looks like people who are known to be a bit colorful in what they like to do and everything, you know, when moments like this came, this is a moment of mortality. So they would even remember the iman that they had in their heart would actually come up. Now the next chapter is what I've been telling you about for a while, which puts into perspective how in this small five, six foot body, you're going to be able to take so much pain. And all of these big scorpions, he's saying scorpions like, what was it? Scorpions like wild mules and snakes that are like broad, like camel's necks and like, how much do you need? You know, you know, small, a few, five, six small scorpions are enough for a human being. So why do you need these big, big things? This puts it into perspective. Nobody's going to be small in paradise. They're going to be massive in paradise. And this is what puts it into perspective. The first thing, hadith from Bukhari, from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, now I'm going to mention the different hadith here. It just puts it into perspective because the Prophet never mentioned it in one go. He mentioned different parts of the body. He's, in this one he says, that which is between the two shoulders of a disbeliever is the distance of three days for a very fast mounted person on a horse. Like how big is that? For three days on a horse, that's miles and miles long, that's crazy. So imagine how big hellfire is. That's a lot of space. All of that is going to affect the small soul. All of that is going to affect us. Now, today on our body, if you've got just small pain here, that affects our soul. If somebody gets burnt for the whole arm, they, they feel. If so, when, when you get hot tea or hot oil, God forbid, on your thigh or something like that, that pains. If somebody's burnt even more, like they, they were in a fire. Right? Imagine if you're, I don't know, a million times bigger than that. And that, imagine how you're going to be able to take that intensity of that pain. Then there's a hadith in Muslim, again from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said that the, this is like just a parable, an example. He says, Dirsul kafir, aw nabul kafir, which means one of the, the teeth, one tooth of a disbeliever is like the size of Mount Uhud. Now you can see how this is, if that's the size of Uhud, and you can imagine how wide the, the between the two shoulders is like miles and miles. Now it makes, can you see how that becoming proportionate? Right? So if they're miles and miles just in terms of their width, then their tooth is going to be like Mount Uhud. Right? And the thickness of their skin, again, because how thick is our skin? It's going to get burnt like that. So the thickness of the skin is three days, is wide as or thick as three days of uh, travel. That means it's going to take a while to get through that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, the intensity, whatever it is. Then there's a narration by Imam Hakim from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Uh, same kind of thing, Dirsul Kafir. But in this one, the, the, the next part in here is Aduduhu, although there's different amounts of thickness mentioned, but I mean, three days is enough, right? In this one, it says 70 cubits. 70 cubits is about 30 to 35 meters in thickness, right? His upper arm is going to be the size of Bayda. Bayda is a place outside of Medina. And his thigh is the size of the area of Warqan, which is again outside Medina Munawar. It's an area. These are areas. So that's how the Prophet described it. His seat, his bottom in the hellfire is going to be between here in Medina, in the middle of Medina, Manawa, and Rabada. Rabada is like an outer uh, suburb, not suburb, it's actually an outer kind of place where Abu Dhar had gone to live alone, right? An outskirt area. That's how big it is. And his stomach is going to be, it's another narration. His stomach is going to be the size of a place called Idom. Then Imam Ahmad has another narration for Abu Hurairah. The Prophet said, 
similar things about the tooth and uh, and everything. And then he says, um, yeah, it's similar. I, I don't have to repeat all of that. There's a number of hadith. Imam Tirmizi has got another narration. It's got two narrations about this. And Imam Ahmad has yet another narration that the Prophet Sallallahu said, now, uh, is that just the size it's going to be? Or is a person going to grow that big and then become smaller? What is it going to be? يَعْظُمُ أَهْلُ النَّارِ فِي النَّارِ The Prophet Sallallahu said, the people of hellfire will become enormous, will grow in a really, really enormous way in the hellfire. Such that, إِنَّ مَا بَيْنَ شَحْمَةِ أُذُنِ أَحَدِهِمْ إِلَىٰ عَاتِقِهِ مَسِيرَةُ السَّبْعِ مِئَةَ عَام Similar, between the lobe of earlobe and his uh, shoulder is going to be 700 years of distance. And, and same thing about the other narrations. I'm just trying to bring you... Yeah, it's, it's uh, numerous narrations. Ibn Majah, Imam Ahmad, Imam Hakim. Then there's a narration of... Uh, well, there's numerous... I'm not going to repeat all of this because they're very, very similar. It's been corroborated by so many narrations. Okay. There's a narration by Imam Ahmad and Imam Tirmidhi from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the disbeliever, his tongue will be so long, disproportionately long. This is not a tongue is going to be massive compared to his, you know, in proportion to his body. No, this is going to be an extra long tongue that he's going to drag behind him. It's going to be so massive, he's going to have to drag it. He's going to dra drag it for two furlongs. And people are going to be trampling over it. This is generally referring to a person who used to say bad things with their tongue. So this is the type of very specific punishment given for somebody who's used their tongue in the wrong way. May Allah protect our tongues from that. And yeah, may Allah protect our tongues. Because imagine that's the punishment. There's another narration of Imam Ahmad and Ibn Majah and Hakim and so on. The Prophet Sallallahu said, now, most of the above narrations were about disbelievers, right? Now, someone says, well, this doesn't, have to be, this doesn't have to be a believer. It could be a disbeliever as well. Inna min ummati man ya'dhumulinnar. Some people from my ummah will be such that they will have to be grown so big in the hellfire, such that eventually they will end up filling up one corner of the hellfire. This one gives us some understanding of why this would happen. Abu Ghassan al-Dabbi says that Abu Huraira radiallahu an who said to me while we were in a place called Hira, right? Do you know Abdullah ibn Khidash? He said to me, do you know Abdullah ibn Khidash? Now, I don't know who this person is, but he was a bad guy, it seems. Do you know him? I've heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying that his thigh in Jahannam will be like Mount Uhud and his tooth will be the size of Bayda. So then I asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why? Why is he like that? He said, because كَانَ عَاقًا بِوَالِدَيْهِ He was disobedient to his parents. You know, when disobedience to parents, it's something which a lot of people struggle with. Because not every parent is easygoing. So it makes it difficult. If parents aren't easygoing, unreasonable, oppressive maybe, it's very difficult to get that balance because you react emotionally. So what should you do? Well, first we need to control ourselves with our parents in terms of how we speak to them. Sometimes we overcome. Sometimes we lose it. We may have had a bad day or whatever. So what do we do? Seek forgiveness. Make amends. Just because we failed, or we, fa we failed a lot of times, doesn't mean you have to carry on doing that. Yes, I believe that there's a lot of people who can be overcome, and they just can't help it sometimes. That doesn't justify it. And make amends as soon as possible. May Allah forgive. That should not become the norm then that it's fine now, I've, I've messed myself up. Yeah, there's forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help. Hassan, Ibn Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he mentioned the people of Hellfire and he said that they're going to become so big in there 
they're going to be like the size of somebody who travels fast for three days and three nights. One of their tooth will be like a very, very long palm tree. Their bottom will be like a mountain pass. Their hands, this is this huge monster like almost, this huge, may Allah not allow us to be in there. Their hands will be tied to their necks. And their hands will be tied to their necks and their, their foreheads will be by their feet. So they'll be rolled up like that. The angels will be striking them on their faces, on their backs, and they will be dragging them to the hellfire. So then one of them eventually will say to the angel, Irhamni, have some mercy on me, have some mercy on me. And he'll say, how can I have mercy on you and Allah when the most merciful one hasn't had mercy on you? Because your actions were like that. But in this world, the merciful one is there. Ya Arham Ar-Rahimin, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimin, Irhamna, have mercy upon us and allow us to change our ways so that we don't end up like this. Right, a few other points and then we finish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, verse 104, The flame will overcome their faces, will be overwhelming their faces, and they will be very gloomy and downcast therein. That's what it means. So Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, وَهُمْ فِيهَا كَارِهُونَ Meaning, the hellfire will burn them. So the top lip will kind of get pulled and contract until it will, this whole, th- I mean, subhanallah, this whole part here will get pulled up and it'll, it'll come to the head. So it's like the whole skin has been pulled up. And the bottom one will hang loose down. Like really hang loose down. So it'll be this really ugly, ghastly picture. Imam Ahmad and Imam Tirmidhi and Hakim transmitted this. And Hakim, Hakim and Tirmidhi have said this is Sahih narration. That's what it means by gloomy. Not just like downcast. It's their whole face would be distorted. Made to look ugly. He's saying it's like, you know when you have a, a comb. So when you have a comb, if you've got your lips pur- pursed, you can't see the teeth, the teeth. If the top lip has been pulled up and the bottom one has been dragged down, then it will all be exposed along with everything else. I mean, you see these in some kind of horror depictions, but this is like in real life. We mentioned a story to you before of Tawus who had two ways to come back after Maghrib. And if he ever came back from the mountainous way, and he would see these mountain tops looking very downcast, that would remind him of this picture in Hellfire. He, he, when he came back, he couldn't eat. If he ever came back that way, he couldn't eat. In, in fact, different people. Uwais, when he would look at barbecued meat, especially the head, you know, if they were doing the whole animal or something like that. He would remember this verse and then he would just faint. People would think he's crazy. Okay. The next, the last uh, verse we're going to look at today is from Surah An-Nisa, verse 56. It's in a similar. Right? Allah says, <laughs> كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا لِيَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ This verse <coughs> puts more in Now, we understand that a person is going to be enormous and have this very thick skin where the punishment is going to be afflicted. What this verse is saying that those who disbelieve our verses, we're going to enter them into a hellfire. And every time their skin is... Uh, done, we're going to change that skin to a fresh skin so that they can feel the punishment. Going to be constantly renewed to con- continue the punishment. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu relates that once by his father Umar radiallahu anhu, somebody read this verse, Kullama nadija juluduhum baddalnahum juludun ghayra. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, please repeat that. He repeated it. Then Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu was there. He said, I've got the tafsir of it. I know the tafsir of this. So, you know, we were saying 
earlier that he's going to have a massive body with very thick skin. And I was saying that I don't know how long it's going to take to get through that. Well, it's not going to take long at all. This replacement of the skin, according to this narration, is that it says, فِي السَّاعَةِ الْوَاحِدَ مِئَةَ مَرَّةٍ Now, sa'a could mean one hour, or it could mean a moment. It's going to be refreshed a hundred times. Whether that be in an hour, that's, big, that's bad enough. That's more than, in one hour, that's more than one a minute. And if sa'a means less than that, then that, that's just a mind-boggling idea. So it's going to be constantly changed. So the punishment is constant. It's not like, okay, the skin is gone. We got some you know, time before the next one. No, it's just continuous. So then Umar said, yes, that's exactly how I heard it from the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Abi Hatim ibn Marduya has transmitted this. And Thawr, uh, Ibn Umar says that when their skins burn up, the new skin that they get is going to be again fresh like paper. Like just absolutely fresh and pure, it's going to be affected again. Imagine baby skin. It's like you get baby skin, like fresh skin, and it gets burnt. You get fresh skin, it gets burnt. Then in another one, it says that for the display, there's going to be a hundred skins. Between every skin will be a different type of punishment. So every skin change will be a different type of punishment. Now how? I don't know. But I just don't want to be that. I don't want to check it out. Hassan Basri rahimullah used to say about this that the hellfire will consume them every day 70,000 times. Now that's getting 70,000 times in 24 hours. Every time their skin gets consumed, it'll, they'll say, Udu, like re- return that, and they will go back to what it was before. I think we'll stop here today. The next ones will be about their face about what's going to happen to their face, and that continues that. Again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The more we learn about hellfire, the more the reality of it kicks in. And may Allah increase our fear based on this as well. And may Allah allow us to be protected from this on the Day of Judgment. One bit of solace is that a lot of this bad punishment is mentioned about disbelievers. That doesn't mean believers won't have a punishment, because even a fraction of this right, for a believer is bad enough. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Maybe that's why we're even studying this in the first place. Otherwise, why would Allah allow us to study this? And, you know, not many people get to study this. So may Allah make this a source of, uh, a source of safety for us. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Insha'Allah, we'll see you in the next session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.